Distinguished speakers, ladies and gentlemen, my name is Cornelia Woll. I'm the president of the Hattie School, and it is my great pleasure and honor to welcome you here tonight for our Hattie Future Forum, Too Smart to Regulate, How AI Challenges Good Governance. Tonight is the fifth Futures Forum in our series marking the Hattie School's 20th anniversary. We have used these events as an opportunity to reflect on the past two decades and generate insights and discussions for innovative policy solutions to chart the way forward. We ask what did the world look like when we were created 20 years ago and what do we know now? How do we prepare future decision makers for the challenges in 2044, 20 years from now? And we do this topic by topic and today we are talking about AI. To say that we have come very far on this topic on AI and technology in government is of course an understatement. Indeed, people watching us in 2004 might have viewed our discussions today to be the stuff of a science fiction novel. It is not news to anyone in the room that generative AI has emerged as a transformative force in recent years. These new technologies used in everything from jet GPT to deep fake videos or autonomous driving to new medical products promise to alter not just industries or even economies, but the tissue of our societies. It is exactly the fast pace of this technology and its widespread impact that require a similarly quick and agile reaction from our policymakers, entrepreneurs, and civil society organizations. Luckily, we see that many have taken up the challenge. 2024 promises to be a crucial year for AI development and regulation. Most promising, the imminent adoption of the EU AI Act will mark the world's first comprehensive AI law. This evolution brings us to many of the core questions around what should be regulated, who should be responsible, and how to ensure transparency, fairness, and accountability in these AI systems. Universities have an important role to play in this debate, including providing a deeper understanding of these developments and shaping the directions of the technology and the policies governing them for the years to come. The experts must not only focus on how to ensure good governance in the policies surrounding these technologies, but also address ethical concerns and potential disruptions associated with the use of generative AI, all the while not curtailing the power that they hold for the way in which we develop economically and as a society. We are at the Hattie School proud of our contributions to this discussion, in particular with the work of our Center for Digital Governance and our Data Science Lab. Since its founding, the Center for Digital Governance has focused on AI and the human transformation, the governance of digital services, and the digitalization of government. But differently, it focuses on the governance of artificial intelligence and digital spaces, which are both, with, which are both reach far beyond, which both reach far beyond traditional political boundaries. But also explores how public administrations within these boundaries and countries can integrate the digital revolution into their daily work to do it better. The Hattie School's Data Science Lab was created as a center for training the next generation of experts who use data science for the public good and has been instrumental for developing our Master of Data Science for Public Policy <coughs> program. But very quickly, it has grown into an even more ambitious unit, a research hub for tackling societal challenges with computational and data-intensive methods, where we explore the contributions massive data sources can make to governance problems in a variety of areas ranging from political behavior, disinformation, climate mitigation, public health, or the topic of today, AI regulation. With this diverse expertise on the topic, the Hattie School has been able to drive the discourse and be a source of valuable research, both within our own community and outside, for policymakers and the media. Tonight, we are thrilled that both of these centers have brought together a wonderful panel of experts and um, the policymakers that are actually shaping the regulation and the entrepreneurs that are part of this development so we can engage on the different perspectives. With their background in the different uh, sectors, this, the panelists will bring diverse viewpoints about the needs and challenges for 2024 
and maybe well for the challenges of, of 2044. And I'm really looking forward to the discussion. Before I hand over the stage to Dani Stockmann and Lynn Karg to introduce our panelists, I would like to ex extend a quick word of thanks. First, to all my colleagues at the Center for Digital Governance and the Data Science Lab, in particular, Dani Stockmann, Simon Munzat, Lynn Karg, Joanna Bryson, Gerhard Hammerschmidt, as well as Maite Kersand, Hui Dang, and Johanna Winter for their excellent support. Andrew Dimery, <laughs> forgot you in the list. Um, I would also like to extend my gratitude to our partners at Kristen Company, in particular Matthias Zeller, where is he, for the continued support. Matthias Zeller is the managing director and co-founder of Kristen Company and the Hertie School alum of the class of 2021, 20, 20, 20. And so we're happy to see you here in this double role. The event would not be possible without the organization of our communications team, especially Benjamin Stappenbeck, Tuha Dang, Matt Longthorne, and Sophie Morris, as well as our fundraising team, Sasha Stolzenburg and Olga Maskevich, who continue to be kept very busy with our 20th anniversary festivities. A big thank you to all of you for making tonight possible. And without much further ado, I will pass the microphone to Daniela Stockman and Lynn Karg. Many thanks to all of you, and the uh, floor is yours. First, first, we would like to ask our panelists to join us here uh, on stage. Um, and welcome, welcome to our discussion on Too Smart to Regulate, How AI Challenges Good Governance. As we have just heard, a consensus seems to be emerging, uh, to, to be emerging uh, amongst both regulators, uh, lawmakers, but also even amongst tech companies. Sam Altman from OpenAI asked the US Senate openly, please regulate us. <laughs> um, and even though this consensus seems to be emerging that AI should be regulated, there's still a lot of uncertainty about how such regulation should be looking like. Um, today, we're gonna discuss uh, questions such as what should be regulated, who should be involved in making decisions about regulation, and how does good governance in the digital age look like? And to get our discussion started, we're delighted to have four experts with us uh, tonight. Thank you all for joining us. Um, to my right is uh, Kai Zena, who is Digital Policy Advisor at the European Parliament, where he is the Head of Office for MEP Axel Foss, who was also a Shadow Rapporteur for the AI Act in European Parliament, which has just been signed very recently. So Kai is very much an expert on the politics behind AI regulation. Thank you for joining us tonight, Kai. <laughs> Um, and uh, to his right is uh, Matthias Spierkamp, uh, co-founder and executive director of Algorithm Watch, an NGO based here in Berlin that aims to strengthen the role of AI in democracy, justice, and sustainability. A very warm welcome to you, Matthias. Um, then we have Carla Husted with us, who is also a Herti alumna. Um, I think 2014 is the, is the year where you were at the Heritage School, so we're delighted to have you join us. She is now the director of the Center for Digital Society at the Mercato Foundation, which she joined after leading the Bertelsmann Foundation's Ethics of AI project. And she has also advised the AI Enquete Commission in German Bundestag. We're delighted to have you, Carla. And last but not least, Jan Hisserich, um, Vice President of Strategy and Communications of Aleph Alpha, a German company in the field of artificial intelligence based in Heidelberg. And Aleph Alpha has been very much in the German and also European news on the discussion regarding AI regulation. Uh, thank you so much for joining us, Jan. Um, I am Dani Stockman. I'm Professor for Digital Governance and also Director of the Center for Digital Governance and <clears throat> Hi, I'm Lynn Kark. I'm an assistant professor for computer science um, for public policy. And I am also faculty at the data science lab, which is co-hosting this event and the Center for Sustainability. So um, we wanted to dive into this discussion by giving each of you an opportunity to briefly um, discuss one risk of your choosing. Hopefully each of you has a different risk or a different perspective on that risk that um, of AI that would need to be regulated in your opinion. 
So I think we can just go in order. So, okay. Well. Um, happy to do so. Um, of course, this question would be highly dependent on where we actually apply AI. And I feel like one of the biggest challenges of this debate is that usually when you bring different people to the table, everybody's talking about something different. But maybe I want to therefore focus on something that almost all application areas have in common, which is accountability and power concentration. Um, and there are several factors that are kind of specific to automated decision-making systems and to AI that make it so hard to actually create accountability over decision-making. Um, I was recently asked again, once again, whether we actually need new commandments or new human rights for the digital age. And my answer usually is no, we have these and they should still be um, valid in the digital age. But what we need is um, new mechanisms that actually make sure that we have accountability, that we have proper oversight. We all know the whole um, narrative around AI being a black box. So there are certainly um, some technical features that make it hard to establish oversight. Um, but I feel like the biggest challenge often is rather the one of governance. We see in many contexts that there's new stakeholders involved in decision-making processes. For example, when we have uh, public sector use of AI, the people that understand the social needs, that have direct contact to the people affected, are not necessarily um, capable anymore to understand the impact of the technology, to understand which technical features actually need to be changed in order to get the impact that we need to see. And we have quite complex value chains, which we haven't understood, also in the context of generative AI, um, where we definitely need a better understanding of responsibilities along the value chain. And something we've seen and that connects to this problem of our accountability is um, a concentration of power in digital markets. We've seen this already years ago with regards to social networks. And we're now seeing how big tech companies are trying to leverage their power again in the context of generative AI. There's investments flowing into um, AI companies. Um, like across the stream, uh, big companies like Microsoft uh, or Google are trying to use also their infrastructure power to put pressure on smaller stakeholders that are more downstream. And this is um, making it hard to hold them accountable. It's also making it hard to actually align AI with public values. And uh, honestly, I think it's costing all of us a lot of money. So it's not just problematic from a human rights perspective, but also from an economic one. And maybe one big problem that is not that cannot be solved with regulation, but it's connected to this, is that I think um, this concentration of power and this lack of accountability, lack of transparency, actually leads us um, to a situation where we don't use AI for good in the way we could. And one part of our work at the Mercato Foundation is not just to um, fund organizations that hope to create more transparency and accountability, but also to work on the digital transformation of the public sector. Because we do see more and more anti-democratic stakeholders actually making use of AI. And we also see people losing trust in the capabilities of the public sector, of democratic stakeholders to do the same. So there's a much bigger, the divide is actually becoming bigger between let's call them bad stakeholders using the new technologies and pro-democratic stakeholders being capable to do so as well. So the lack of um, use of the opportunities in some way is related to this as well. Great. Thank you so much for bringing accountability and oversight up and for the detailed discussion of those. Um, then um, I would like to hear from Jan, maybe the perspective also of a, one of the companies that's stakeholders working in the space. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, hope you can hear me. Is that? Okay, great. Uh, so um, I was thinking about good governance a lot, um, not only because it resonates with me. Uh, as some of you may know, my first academic career was in political science. Um, and it brought back some, some fond memories of like, what does that actually really mean? Uh, and the, the governance part, I mean, it's interesting to see that, you know, you have these definitions and some of them diverge quite widely, funnily enough. Um, and, uh, but I settle for the United Nations one, which I like because it's very short. It's uh, governance is basically making decisions and implementing them, uh, which I like. Uh, and then there's a good part, uh, which is a bit more tricky. Uh, I mean, they define eight 
character characteristics of good governance, explainability, accountability are, are two of them, and that resonates a lot with me because uh, as Alp Alpha, as a representative of Alp Alpha, I, uh, you know our mission is to provide human-centric, sovereign, trustworthy AI, where all these things are already incorporated. Uh, I'm going to tell tell about that uh, a bit more later on, but when it comes to Talking about accountability, explainability, um, you know, these are very technical terms because what does that really mean? What does that mean to me may, may diverge from what it means to you. Uh, good is like a very broad term, which means many things to many people, right? Um, and all of a sudden you have the dilemma that you may not, uh, you know, you may not agree and life is full of dilemmas. And, um, uh, and, and that brings me to, to, to the thing uh, that kind of you know disturbs me with the current debate because the current debate is so much about technology, uh, and sometimes it circles just around technology as if technology would be an end in itself, uh, which simply isn't true. If you if you want to look at technology in a in a much more productive way, you have to look at look at technology in a much broader broader sense, um, and I guess that's what we're here for to 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 discuss as well. Um, and the same when you when it applies to regulation. Uh, I think it wouldn't be it would be weird to look at regulation. And sometimes I get the impression that it goes down that route to uh, as something that is basically um, an excuse to 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 allow people to stop thinking. Um, you know, there's a regulator and he's going to take care of it, or he or she or it is going to take care of it. Uh, and uh, you know, there's regulation, and we don't have to worry. I think that that would be exactly the wrong way to deal with it. It would be bad regulation in that sense, uh, and bad governance, I guess. So what I what I want to say is, um, for me, and that's not my my wisdom. There's a there's a philosopher called Hubert Dreyfus. He wrote that in the 70s already, uh, as he was at that time grappling with. Many of the questions that we are currently dealing with is very actually it's, it's quite contemporary in many ways, and he said uh, um, that the, the the greatest danger is not the advent of super intelligent machines but of sub intelligent humans, and I really like that because uh, especially when it comes to technology, um, again the the role of technology is to broaden our perspective and not to narrow it, uh, and I would like to see that more often, um, but that requires much more debate about what is technology actually good for, what is, what is it supposed to do, um, and what are its limits, what are its opportunities. It's a much broader societal debate that we have to have instead of just focusing on flops or any, anything like that. Just okay. to make sure, can I just jump in? Um, Jan, just to make sure that I'm understanding correctly. So would you say that um, AI poses some risks but it shouldn't be regulated then? Because no. <laughs> no. <laughs> No, sorry, uh, I was definitely sending the wrong message. No, uh, there, there's a bad side. I, I would. What I'm saying is, there's a there's, regulation would be bad if I would pretend that look, you know, the regulation is now sparing you the task of thinking about what's happening and what's going on. I'm a fan of regulation in the sense that that uh, that it provides. Uh, it, it, it basically provides, um, you know, uh, like it it, it gives guardrails within you can operate and you know even from a from a from a uh, entrepreneurial and and organ like standpoint uh, i very much welcome that um, when it's not i think regulation is not good if it like tech like the technology debate circles around itself as if it would be an end in itself and that's wrong gotcha okay thank you i'm still taking away that the risk the one risk that you mentioned are sub-intelligent humans. Um, so <laughs> I don't know if you want to summarize in one word. Is a risk, those. Yes. Okay. Um, all right. Um, yeah, I'd be curious to hear from Matthias. Yeah, I'll be a little sneaky and rephrase that question um, because you asked what is one risk of AI that you feel uh, needs to be regulated, uh, needs to be regulated, and I would uh, sort of rephrase that to um, what is a risk of AI that needs to be tackled or confronted, uh, which is similar enough, I thought, when I prepared for this. Um, and that is that um, I think, and we at Algorithm Watch think that many of these discussions um, are based on something that I would call a false balance. And that false balance 
uh, means that we are looking at capabilities of so-called AI technologies and what they can achieve and then uh, we say, okay, and we need to now balance the risks of these technologies with the opportunities. And um, why is that a false balance? Because for the longest time, we have seen very, very broad claims being made about the capabilities of AI, and we haven't really seen those materialize. And um, I'm not saying that, for example, um, new latest developments, generative AI, don't, um, or others, let's say, um, uh, the, the same thing or, you know, that we had 20 years ago uh, when we talked about um, Garry Kasparov being beaten in a chess match by a computer. I'm not saying that, but what I'm saying is that f for 60 years, probably, we have heard that AI is going to solve um, the biggest problems of humanity, and we haven't seen that happen. And why haven't we seen that happen? Because the biggest problems of humanity cannot be solved by technology. And um, what struck me was that last December there was the interim report published by um, the high-level advisory board on AI um, that was instituted by the United Nations, um, the uh, digital envoy, tech envoy, forgot exactly what the name is, um, and they put in that report a section on early promises of AI helping to address climate change. And I would like to quote directly what they're saying, uh, what one of these opportunities is uh, or promises. Using advanced climate modeling tied to information about urban mobility and behavior patterns to create new early warning systems allowing for more effectively effective delivery of post-conflict, post-disaster, relief and recovery. And I'm like, oh, that's wonderful. And at the same time, Sam Altman is telling us that we need enormous amounts of, first of all, energy and other resources, and of course, all the materials that his seven bazillion uh, euro plan or dollar plan to come up with uh, new uh, hardware to train AI um, will um, extract from our planet. But it's fantastic that we can then use that technology to have smarter disaster relief. So this is what I'm talking about when I say there is a false balance that is the basis of much of our uh, discussion. And I'd, I'd like to end here and see whether we can actually um, um, approach that with better ideas for regulation. Great, thank you. You brought up a topic that's near and dear to my heart, which is the effects on greenhouse gas emissions and energy consumption. Um, okay, so last um, but not least is uh, your opinion, Kai. Yeah, gladly. Um, maybe to, to answer on that very shortly, um, I do think, or we in the European Parliament, were always um, underlining that certain machine learning or deep learning uh, technologies do not need that much energy uh, compared to a foundation model. And I think those technologies can really detect certain, for example, energy consumption patterns and so on, and actually do rather good work and help us to uh, mitigate climate change. But this was another point. Point. Um, if you ask me about what I think is the um, biggest risk, um, I would go back to a very hype topic that was already mentioned by Matthias, uh, Gen AI. And I say hype because I think a lot of those risks that we are currently talking about, are, and there we are completely aligning, I think um, are really distracting from um, current risk, from actual risks that we should really concentrate about. But there's one thing that is really making me a bit nervous, which is that Gen AI is really something new in a way that it's creating um, content that the human is, at the moment at least, lacking the digital skills or digital literacy to really make sure, is this AI content, is this not AI content? And I think in a kind of transition period, this will lead to a lot of problems that 
I don't know, in, in private life, we are unsure if uh, the picture of our friends uh, are really uh, accurate. Um, in, in political life, we don't know if a speech that we are uh, seeing is uh, correct or true, and so on and so on. And I do think, because I'm an optimist, uh, that after a few years, we will manage to have a better eye to catch certain things that are not correct and so on. But in this transition period, I am a bit afraid that if bad actors, let's call it like this, um, have maybe good strategy and are developing good uh, ways to interfere with our democracy, to interfere uh, with our election system, maybe also use uh, Gen AI foundation models for um, very sophisticated uh, cyber attacks and so on. Uh, the DGAP, um, Katja there, the researcher, was actually writing, um, um, I think several weeks ago, a large piece on interference by foundation models in election. Uh, this year there are a lot of elections. And again, my point is that we are probably not really prepared right now. Uh, digital literacy is missing. The regulator was also a bit too late, even though this topic was clear that it's rather urgent for now many years, but we were distracted with a lot of other things. Now there is the Digital Services Act, there is the AI Act, political advertisement regulation, all from the European Union. Those things will probably help, but the AI Act is not in force in time um, um, before the elections are taking place. The DSA um, is coming um, or is becoming applicable, but probably it will take a little bit of time until the enforcement and governance mechanism are in place. Meaning, again, to my point, I'm really worried about the next months and maybe one, two years in this transition period if we as democracies are really um, yeah, defending uh, our status quo and hopefully the bad actors, as I said, are lacking at the same time the knowledge to really use those um, technologies properly. I think Carla wanted to react. Yeah, if possible. Um, so while I would very much agree um, regarding your worry around the spread of disinformation and malicious use of social networks by anti-democratic stakeholders, I'm quite unsure whether um, generative AI really does make a substantive a difference here, because if we if we look at the spread of disinformation in the past and strategies that anti-democratic stakeholders have used, it wasn't really about like technological complexity. Like last year in Germany, there's one disinformation that spread in the context of the Russian uh, war in Ukraine, where um, the stakeholders that spread this narrative just used a picture from a climate protest where people were lying on the floor. It was a, uh, a film originally, and somebody moved. And they used this picture, so you see supposedly dead people moving to say, look, the people in Ukraine, they aren't actually dead. And this was not AI generated. You just needed to take the picture, take it completely out of context, put it in a different context, and then make use of um, the algorithmic systems that spread these kind of, um, these kind of images, specifically if they're extreme, if they're negative, and if they fit to the business models behind these uh, social networks. So in some way, I... I'm hopeful that maybe the like the higher awareness around the spread of disinformation that is now also in the wider public can actually help us with a phenomena that we've had um, before. I mean, if we look at uh, the spread of, of content through, for example, the AfD in Germany on TikTok, they have more views than all democratic parties together. And this has nothing to do with generative AI. It's just their, their strategy over there. Yeah, thank you for weighing in. Um, I think from from my perspective, if I may add that as well, um, I think we do have new capabilities with generative AI, um, especially in writing texts, like flooding, for example, with realistic inputs to Wikipedia or to other online platforms, which before wasn't possible, but I think it's an important point to make that that was previously also already possible. Um, Yes, um, thank you so much. Um, so we, we heard of a lot of risk and a lot of opinions towards um, regulation. 
And um, I'm going to hand over to Dani for the next question. Yeah, we thought it would be a good point to move on towards uh, the politics behind some of the new regulations that have been passed. And Kai, you have been very much working in European Parliament during the trilogue uh, period. Um, what was so challenging about getting the AI Act passed? And can you tell us some more um, background information on the positions of political parties? Yes, of course. Um, so a few points there. Uh, first of all, AI in the European Parliament, but it was also here in the uh, German Bundestag, uh, Bundes, uh, it tech, it, what was it, Ethic, Ethic Commission, exactly, um, was working on it, and um, my colleagues told me there were similar problems. Um, in Brussels, the parliament was really divided. There was uh, half of the parliamentarians that really underlined and are very scared about certain risks, uh, not only about AGI or <laughs> those things, but more about uh, systemic uh, discrimination, uh, the use of, um, or the, the um, existence of biases, and so on and so on. I need to say I do understand and do share a lot of those things that this camp within the parliament was uh, scared about. Then we um, had already a short discussion on it. Uh, the other camp in the parliament was f only focusing, mostly focusing on um, opportunities. Uh, how can AI help to um, fight climate change, to uh, fight starvation, and so on and so on. But if you have a parliament that is basically divided in the middle with 50-50, um, making compromises is extremely hard. And basically this we saw in the whole discussions that um, yeah, it was so fragile, the majority, um, that every element that, for example, the Social Democrats were getting was leading then to the CDU, to the Greens, uh, to the FDP to say, ah, no, now it's our turn and so on. So it, it was really, really, really difficult. And I think this was until the end one of the major stumbling points, this complete different vision of what means AI for us. But there were a few more points, if you allow me. Um, secondly, um, it's, it's always a case, people like um, us who are now on digital policy making for quite some time know it from the past. If you want to regulate something in the digital field, you are always too late. There is um, a, a tremendous speed um, that um, also when the data protection, uh, the GDPR, uh, was being discussed, um, is there, is happening. So often, even when you are discussing certain things and they are making a lot of sense, um, maybe the principles are still applicable, but um, there are new factors to consider and so on. And this with Gen AI, again, we as European Parliament, um, thought um, with the release of ChatGPT and even before, hmm, there is something that the Commission was not really reflecting when they were uh, making their proposal. Maybe we as European Parliament, which is rather unusual, really need to put a complete new chapter in. So this was another point, and I would say compared in my 10 years in Brussels, compared to a lot of other fights, AI is maybe the most dynamic field that I ever tried to regulate or to uh, work on. Um, another point um, was um, that yeah, there were so many actors involved um, in the AI Act due to the fact that the European Commission has chosen a horizontal um, regulation um, to really create a kind of silver bullet that is applicable for every use case, for every sector, and so on. They created in Brussels a big problem that basically all committees of the European uh, Parliament were feeling we should be responsible for the AI Act because it's also about agriculture, for example. It's also about fishery and so on. The same in the Commission. Um, every DG, every commissioner felt 
why is Breton doing AI? I should be uh, doing AI. And in the end, it led to a situation that there was only uh, one commissioner or two commissioners responsible, one DG, one unit, um, two lead committees, one working group, but a lot of extremely disappointed working groups, uh, MEPs and so on, uh, because what I said already, they had actually credible arguments uh, for saying we should also be involved. Uh, but in the end, it led to the situation that um, yeah, a lot of um, people were not really involved, that had a lot of things to say, and um, a rather bad atmosphere, I would say, in the, within the institutions of mistrust of, uh, yeah, of a lot of other things. Let's uh, stop there. And maybe the uh, final point why AI regulation was really difficult was, um, and I think there all of us share again uh, what I'm now saying, that there is in Brussels right now this push to do more and more laws uh, faster, 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 no matter how the quality is looking like and how the input is um, what uh, yeah, is uh, in the end. And um, with the AI Act, it was really um, a particular case because it, it took us so long to agree on basic things that then we were kind of, yeah, in November, December, very close to the European election, which will happen this year in June. And um, in order to still bring the law before the election uh, forward and let it enter into force, we needed to stop in the end of January. And which means that, yeah, I would say half of the law and especially Article 5 that Matthias cares very much about was basically discussed in three days of political trialogue without in-depth discussions, without consultations of experts and so on. And you really need to say speed trumped quality, which is in the end, I think, bad for everyone, for civil society, for industry, for academics, for everyone. And I think those four factors really played together rather negatively and made it at least challenging. Uh, we still managed to uh, produce some good results, but there are also a few bad ones. And I would say they are the result of those four elements that I mentioned. Would anybody uh, else want to follow up or weigh in here? Yeah, I think <clears throat> I think everything you just said, uh, I would like to echo, um, especially the last thing. I think uh, by doing it that way, you do like the the cause of good regulation a disservice, because you know I can only I can only talk as a as a practitioner. You know, we're very much in a very we're operating in a very nested market. Uh, and you, right, you rightfully said that you know it's, it's, an, it's a new technology. Um, it, it didn't come out of nowhere. Uh, I, I need to I need to say that as well. But um, I mean, we we we're thinking about uh, how how can we really implement that technology? In I mean, we're a B two B company. We don't do B two C for reasons. Um, but you know, there's so many open questions of how to how to do this, and sometimes it feels to me like we're we're thinking about the seatbelt and the airbag before before we even have thought about what's the product. <laughs> I mean, what's the car? Uh, and that's that's very that's that's not helpful. Um, uh, and uh, even though I, I I do firmly believe that regulation is necessary, uh, I think here it was it was just too rushed. Uh, it's too many open questions, and that shouldn't. That I mean, again, that kind of leads to very likely leads to a situation for us as a company, where we have to grapple with with open questions that probably, essentially, eventually will be decided in court. I guess, uh, which is doing a disservice to the industry in Europe, uh, because we have to we have to we have to deal with that, and it takes up a lot of time. But also, when it comes to trust in public institutions. I think uh, you know this is probably not going down too well. Uh, I uh, and and there again, I, I would I would have hoped for a bit more, um, yeah, just you know de deliberation. Like, what what are we actually talking about? Carla, I think you also have um, maybe an interesting story to share because you initiated an open letter to the German government, and. Um, could you just walk us through what happened in that moment, what prompted the letter, and um, why you felt the need to 
have this letter um, published. Um, so the open letter, which was really initiated by a group of, of stakeholders from uh, science, civil society, um, we also tried to get some industry stakeholders on board. Some of them published uh, their own letters with similar statements, which just asked the German government to actually vote in favor of the AI Act. And it relates to what Kai earlier said. Um, this happened in those last days where the German government and other governments had to kind of form an opinion on whether they would adopt the AI Act or not. And at that point in time, um, it looked like this was actually um, at risk, that the German government could either abstain or even vote no uh, together with the French government and that would have meant that we would have ended without any regulation. Mm, and when I heard of that news and it uh, then became public through, through the media that uh, the German government was considering to abstain, I uh, just took the phone and talked to a lot of stakeholders to get a good feeling on what this would actually mean. And even though Literally everybody is not happy with the outcome of the regulation for very different reasons. Um, most of our partners from civil society and science um, are not very happy with, for example, the risk assessment method or generally the product safety approach of the AI Act and a lot of exemptions for government use of AI for surveillance. But still many stakeholders um, said that a vote against the AI Act would leave us in a much worse situation. Um, of regulatory unsafety and that the AI Act is somehow a starting point, that it does have some good due diligence, some transparency requirements that we can work with that do provide some basic protection. Um, and to be honest, I'm, I don't know if there's a good English term for this, I'm just a realpolitiker <laughs> some way, so I, I'm quite pragmatic, I would say, and um, my assessment and the one of the other people initiating and later signing this letter was that um, we wouldn't have been able to get a better version if we would have voted no, particularly looking at the upcoming election, the new commission, which is very likely going to be um, less open, particularly with regards to limiting the use of AI for, for state surveillance. Um, so it was kind of a feeling of, okay, this is better than nothing, <laughs> and that hurt, but I think it was, it was important, and a lot of civil society stakeholders fought really hard for this regulation, and I think you can see a lot of that in the regulation, even though it's not perfect. Um, and then I think there's one more meta point to it, which is that I feel like um, the overall fear and insecurity that we have in the population in Germany and across Europe and kind of a lack of trust in the ability of uh, democratic institutions to actually come to decisions. Um, it would have been a disaster almost if uh, the headlines would have been Europe can't agree on a regulation for AI and in a time where the general tendency is actually very anti-regulation, very self-regulation um, and I think it was just important to get this across and there's now, now it makes it even more important now to actually look at ways to still improve this regulation, to improve the oversight through standard setting, through the delegated acts, through the creation of a very impactful participatory oversight body. Kai would like to <clears throat> react. Yeah, very, very shortly. Um, I want to use this uh, moment to really also say thank you on behalf of the European Parliament because we had very, very strong opposition. As you know, you just said it. There was a um, French government, um, a certain um, company from France that was pushing a lot, had a lot of allies in Brussels, and it was looking several times rather bad um, that the European Parliament as such would not get um, anything with regards to AI value chain obligations, foundation models, and so on and so on. And it was really, um, I would say, a very, very good signal coming from Germany, but also from a lot of other member states that you said it, um, academics, civil society, and um, also industry players, we are partnering up and we are saying a lot of similar uh, points. Applied AI from Munich had a very supportive letter and so on. And this really helped us in Brussels to 
uh, push back. And even in Brussels, we had a rather unique uh, alliance between CDU, Greens, and so on and so on, all fighting for the same thing. Uh, but yeah, once again, thank you. <laughs> I should also mention that Algorithm Watch also has an open letter, I think, on the convention, the, the Council of Europe's convention on AI, <laughs> which is going to deliberate in, in a few days on March 11th. So uh, exciting times. Um, but um, Carla just mentioned it's now upon um, uh, uh, regulators and also the implementers of the AI Act to to. Im to implement and improve the legislation and Algorithm Watch has um, identified a number of loopholes in the AI Act. What are those and uh, how can they be improved? Um, if I may, I, I would like to take a step back and also react to what was said before because um, I'm still trying to make sense of you know how this all happened and the way I make sense of it is that, you know, we, um, again, coming back to this idea of, you know, these magical capabilities of AI, uh, that we had this new hype, not the one that we're talking about now, not generative AI, but like, you know, uh, almost uh, uh, 10 years ago, maybe eight years ago, that companies were coming out uh, or coming um, um, out of this, what was called the AI winter, you know, when um, there was um, the, the development was stalling and all of a sudden new um, possibilities with um, better uh, storage capabilities and better processing capabilities and, you know, you had these um, new innovations and everyone was um, marketing this as the new wave and um, there would be, yeah, uh, basically um, uh, blue skies forever. And that meant, on the other hand, that there was this AI um, 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 apocalypse uh, narrative that, uh, you know, in a different way than we have it right now, but this is going to present an enormous danger uh, because of all these things of discrimination and, um, uh, uh, and, and bias and so on. And in that situation, I think this caught the eye of politicians. And then it was Ursula von der Leyen coming in as the um, head of the EU commi Commission and one in one of her maybe it was the first speech that she gave as commission president, she said, in a hundred days, we'll have regulation on AI. And I still picture, you know, the people in the EU commission running, running around in the hallway screaming, you know, the ones <laughs> responsible for, the, for this potential file that didn't even exist at the time, thinking, you know, what did, what, why did she say that? You know, a hundred days, it's impossible. And of course it was impossible, so they created... But then this um, brought us on this path that then all of a sudden meant black box AI meets black box EU, right? I mean, all the stuff that you talked about, how are laws being made in Brussels? <laughs> you know, we're in Berlin, so we think about Bismarck and sausages and laws are being made and, you know, the people shouldn't know how it is being done, right? Yes, uh, because otherwise they would be quite fearful. Um, and, and, um, and, and now we are in the situation that Everything had to be done in a hurry. Um, I'm not happy with that, and I'll come to the loopholes in a second. But I would also like to respond to Jan and say, when is the right time? You know, when is the right time to regulate? As if we could say that, oh, we should have waited 50 more years to come up with traffic regulations because we didn't know everything about cars at the time. And um, we, you know, can wait until, I don't know what, you know, we have uh, more than uh, 5,000 uh, fatalities on streets um, uh, per year. And then it would be the right time to regulate. Not that I'm claiming that there are these fatalities, uh, you know, triggered by AI. I'm just saying it's a very, very tough decision also for the regulator to say this is the right time. I think, having said all that, it's good that it happened because now we have something that we can look at and that we can try to improve. But as Algorithm Watch, we are of course not satisfied with the outcome and especially not because we think that um, the loopholes are mainly on 
um, or, or mainly putting marginalized people in a, at a disadvantage. You know, we had all this discussion about generative AI, and yes, we weighed in, but at the same time, we said, let's not make this the center of the discussion, because what has been done is that we don't have a real ban on um, remote biometric identification. We have enormous loopholes for the application of AI in security, in migration management, and all this basically affects the most vulnerable people in our society. And that is a very, very high price to pay. And we were not happy to pay it. Um, we engaged the entire time, and we also then, in the end, we didn't sign the open letter. At the same time, we did not say, kill the AI Act. It's not worth it, you know? Is it better than nothing? We hope it is. Now we have to work on some of the aspects with regulation and oversight and you know, how we can enforce it. Um, but it is, um, you know, it, it's still, I'd say the, the, the final word is still out on you know, um, how to evaluate it. We, need, we will need time to see um, what we can gain from it and what we may lose. Can I answer to that? Yes, sure. Um, so, yeah, I mean, you're right. I'm, I'm not saying, I'm not, I'm not, I wasn't talking about the timing. I was more about uh, referring to the fact that, you know, maybe we should first understand what we're actually talking about. Uh, that was more of a point. Um, I we think, have. well, first of all, I, I, we, we always pretend that, that much of what we're talking about is happening in a vacuum, which, isn't cl which is clearly not true. I mean, when you, when you build products, whatever kind of products, there, there are lots of regulations and laws already in place dealing with them. Um, and I think one of the things that we now have to deal with is uh, how do that now relates to the, to the UAI Act, for example, because they're overlaps. And, and you know, it's, it's very difficult. Sometimes it's contradictory. And it's now up to us to kind of like, look, oh, damn, <laughs> what are we going to do about that? Uh, there are no guidelines at all. So first of all, it's not happening in a vacuum. It's not that like like you know, apocalypse is is around the corner just because we we not do it now. Uh, secondly, I think uh, you know, I, the the whole idea of the UI Act in the beginning was more. It wasn't it wasn't so much about like oh yeah, we have to regulate the bad guys. More like provide an environment for innovation, which I very much liked. And again, it's down to the point I was making earlier. Uh, regulation is a good thing if it provides guardrails and gives you kind of an idea of okay, so that's 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 the that's the the space we're operating in. Um, uh, but what happened really was that now all of a sudden Gen AI came around the corner and everybody was trying to make sense of it because it didn't really fit into the buckets that that were there. Uh, and originally the whole idea was you know let's not talk about technology, let's talk about use cases. But all of all of a sudden it was about technology, and it was circling around technology. In, in many ways. Um, I think uh, the regulator at that point uh, kind of, you know, was, I've, I always got the impression at that time that they being played by the big American tech companies who tell them that it's all like so bad and so transformational. Uh, and a lot of that negative energy kind of went into that process. I think talking about time a bit more, uh, you know, we are entering now a time where much of his expectations will be disappointed, which is, uh, which is not uncommon. Any kind of technology, there's, there's this thing called a hype cycle and stuff like that. And why is the hype cycle sometimes going down? Because people realize, oh yeah, there are limitations. <laughs> it's not that panacea that is solving all our problems, which I'm not claiming by the way as well. Um, it has its merits, but it has its limitations. And you know, we're just about to, 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 uh, to find that out. And I think if we would have not been rushed into this, we probably would have realized, okay, we get a better understanding of what we're talking about. We do understand where its limitations lies. We do understand how all this uh, relates to the existing regulation, which is there. So that's, that's, the, that's, that's the point I was trying to make. And then the third meta point I would like to really point out, regulation is, again, it's good, it's necessary. I really truly believe, but uh, one thing that reg you cannot address with regulation is, like, is, is our own responsibility, like me as a citizen. Uh, and I think when we talk about regulation, when we talk about AI and how we have to deal with it, we also, at the same time, always have to talk about better education. 
Because in the end, if you want to assume responsibility for what you're doing, uh, you know, you have to know what you're talking about. And much of the debate, and that's that's something that was bothering me, much of the debate was fueled by complete nonsense. <laughs> I mean, it wasn't. If you really deal with the technology as we do every day, uh, you know, you, you think about it differently. Yes, it's transformational in theory, but to put that in practice, it's so much harder. Um, and uh, uh, so I really call for let's focus on better education again, because that is the best tool to kind of prepare everyone for how to, do, how to deal with, the, with, with what we're grappling with right now. Can I can follow up on that? Oh, <clears throat> just to clarify, um, by better education, um, who do you mean as the audience? Do you mean educate more software engineers, or do you mean educate users? Do you no, edu them? educate AI users. Um, in, in, I, I don't expect anyone to to have like a mint degree or or to to do programming. Um, in, in fact, we actually argue that uh, that the more powerful the technology gets, the more the more uh, the, the, its complement, the human, with its very human characteristics, like context competence, for example, becomes, uh, becomes important. Um, so when I talk about digital education, I'm not talking about everyone needs to be a programmer. It's good to, to, to have a look behind, you know, under the hood and, and understand how things work, because that again would kind of like calm some nerves, I guess, uh, because it's, it's, it's not as, as most people or some people think. But anyway, it's 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 about relearning the ability to question what's going on. There was like at my you know when I was studying at the MIT, there, there was a broad study about how people use technology, and there was a very very concerning study coming out at that time, uh, and they they realized that only six percent of American teenagers aged 15, 25, do know how to evaluate or critically evaluate a website. So they 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 do not they don't learn anymore how to you know weigh in and and understand okay you know the supporting factors there are contradicting factors how do I make up my mind and that is the fuel that 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 we should address that that's that's something that we should address right to crit critically think about what's going on that's something that we literally I mean I I have kids at school. Nobody, nobody uh, teaches them how to how to critically think. Um, Matthias, you had a response. Yeah, I would like to understand what do you mean by we need to understand before we regulate, and who needs to understand this? Do we all need to understand how CRISPR works to have someone regulate genetic engineering? I don't think so. No. Do we interact with Things, or in that case, you know, uh, um, plants or animals that have been genetically engineered. Yes, certainly. You know, um, I resent this idea that first of all, only the people who completely understand, for example, a technology, can regulate it, because we also have to situate technology in a context. And we are talking about socio-technical systems here because they all interact all the time with society. So where does that claim come from that only a machine learning engineer knows how an AI system works? That's basically bullshit. So we need to have all these different people at the table to discuss this. And yes, machine learning engineers should be part of that, but they are only a part of it. The same way that a chemist is only part of um, the discussion about how to regulate chemistry. And then the other aspect is, um, what do we need to know about this all as a society? We claim at Algorithm Watch that we are a liberal organization. Liberal, you know, in the politically liberal sense that we say, you know, there need to be liberties, we need to protect freedom in the sense that we all want to be able to make decisions in a democratic society. So we need a lot of understanding of how our world works. But of course there is a limit. There's a limit and this limit is when you 
try to push the responsibility to the individual and say, hey, you know what, we have all these dark patterns and the search engine is uh, trying to tell me exactly what to click on with all the um, engineering power that is behind it and the psychologists working on this. But yeah, we need digital literacy so people can weigh up, weigh the different, uh, the, the different aspects and then make the correct decision. It has to be both, and what we are discussing is how to find the sweet spot between those things. And I think we will probably not align on where that is, but I just want to say that it's a little too simplistic to say on the one hand, only technologists can understand how to regulate technology and people need to be literate to uh, deal with all that and then we don't have a problem. Maybe just, just one thing to add. Can I, can I just, no, sorry, just very quickly respond to that. I completely agree. I've, I, I, I thought tried, you'd say that. I, I try, <laughs> no, I seriously, I seriously try to spot the, the, the difference in, in argument where we have. Uh, I'm, I'm just, I, I say intentionally that we have, to, we have to think about this much more broadly. And I've, uh, I really do not claim that only those guys who understand it uh, are able to regulate it. By the way, if you, if you want to spot like somebody who's really an expert in AI, that's the first person to to admit that you know there's there's so many questions we don't have answers to so it's it's not that uh, i think someone who would claim that look i have all the answers and and only i know it that's that's a person you would you should probably distrust um, but i agree with everything you just said there's, there's no disagreement so i think carla you had a quick way in because um I'm just having an eye on the time and we need to get to questions from the audience as well soon. Yeah, I mean, just maybe one reason why, uh, understandably, a lot of civil society actors, also including myself, can be quite sensitive to the claim for, for education is because so often it was used to actually argue, let's not talk about regulation and education is the solution. And if we look at the many application cases that yeah. um, the AI Act tries to address, <laughs> there's actually a lot where the people who are affected by potential discrimination never interact with the system yeah. and where education won't help them at all where we need proper oversight at many different levels of the development and implementation phase and I think that's a, a fundamental problem in this argumentation around education even though of course I agree we need more media literacy yeah I, I, again I think you know it, it has to be not one of these single things can solve the problem that we're facing so you know they all have to be we have to think them together. And I, I'm, I'm not saying that a better digital education will render regulation irrelevant. No, not at all. Uh, but what I do say about regulation is, look, let's do good regulation, but it has to be, it has to be very concise because otherwise, you know, if we, if we all disagree on, on, on what exactly does that mean or does that mean or that mean, you know, it's not helping us uh, as as practitioners. Practitioners, uh, and we there's a lot of insecurity. I mean, Kai was talking about that, and you know that 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 again is then detrimental to building up an in, uh, in industry in that in that area. That's a perfect lead into our last question for all of our panelists, and then we're going to open up the floor for your questions. Um, in one word, can each of you? say how you think AI regulation should look like to be able to effectively respond to the challenges and opportunities of AI in the future. Can you give us your one word and a sentence, very briefly, why you choose that word? Kai, do you yes, want to start? Um, yeah, I was thinking about the right word. I would say dynamic. And the explanation is because the law constantly needs to grow be adjusted and to come back uh, needs to include a lot of different actors uh, because they all have certain knowledge that needs to be included and based on that knowledge the law needs to be adjusted built up and so on and so on yeah, probably won't be a surprise that I chose multi-stakeholder. And here's an audience, you know, that understands what I'm talking about. So I'm, I'm not going to go deeper into this. But that would be a great idea if uh, we could have that kind of uh, governance or regulation of AI. Uh, Cosign, and I will add, even though it's two words, well enforced. I think no explanation needed. 
Yeah, I think informed would touch on what you just said uh, or what everyone just said. I th I think uh, this is this is a process that, that where you have to have many people on the table just to say that very very clearly. Uh, but you know, uh, um, I think you you just have to. We all have to better understand where we're coming from, um, and uh, that's something that sometimes I feel is is a bit missing in the debate. Thank you. So um, now we open up the questions to the audience. We unfortunately don't have one of these throw, throw microphones, which would be very useful. So um, yes, you already got a microphone. OK, where do we start? I'm going to say all the way in the back. Hi, first of all, thank you super uh, much for this uh, interesting talk. Um, well, because I heard you say, Matthias, uh, black box AI, um, and then we have black box EU, and as we all know, the next in line is black box Sen Senelec, because we have all the closed conversations that are about to happen with industry leaders that are going to like harmonize all of our ethical standards. And um, I know that the European Court of Justice, I think, just ruled that it has to be uh, open for the public to um, review. And I saw also as well that Sen Senelec then responded uh, by saying, we want to reiterate that our content is still copyrighted. And this was kind of news to me, or I didn't actually understand why are these conversations copyrighted and uh, yeah, how does that work? Kind of, if the conversations are copyrighted, how can we regulate? And maybe uh, another question that was on my mind quite a bit uh, for Ian, that was, um, why is deepfake pornography not part of the AI Act? Maybe that's a question for Kai. Yeah, I can just start maybe with that um, already. So, well, deepfake is part of um, Article uh, 52, Paragraph 3. Um, but, um, yeah, I, I work too more long on the AI Act. I know everything uh, by heart by now. But um, so um, the subcase uh, was never indeed discussed. Again, going back to this problem that we had, there was such a time rush. And unfortunately, different actors blocked themselves so much that we lost also a lot of time and were never able to really, really discuss in detail, for example, all those use cases that are listed in Article 5 or in Annex 3 and the high risk uh, thing. Uh, the topic that you are mentioning is, however, super important and with every expert that we are talking about, this is basically one of the first two, th uh, three things that is being said. Maybe or hopefully Article 52 will help a little bit, but it always has a problem, Article 52 will well will be followed by people who have good intentions <laughs> but the bad actors will not follow a law so this was also a reason why we didn't edit um, some uh, let's say criminal law articles the commission was pushing for it at some stage in a product safety legislation piece because we were saying it doesn't really fit in the AI Act. This is maybe something that the new commission will um, think about. And maybe because I need to say something on standards, I do agree very much with you. However, I think there are some movements and developments in standardization and there for example a really good best practice in the United Kingdom is the digital or the AI standardization hub is I think the name which is basically bringing together smaller market players but also civil society players gives them a fora and then sending two representatives in standardization bodies in BSI in the UK and I truly hope that in the future um, national governments will invest more money uh, and with that helping also two actors that are sitting there, actually three, because also startups and smaller companies often lack the financial resources to enter in standardization. And one last point, um, in Article 41 of the AI Act, there um, is the possibility for the European Commission um, to make common specifications that are complementing technical standards, especially on fundamental rights. So if the Commission has the feeling that there are certain loopholes in those technical standards, they can fill up those loopholes. Yeah, which I think is really important because uh, my comment on that is that um, I'm pretty um, 
uncertain how to address the standardization question and I think and why am I so uncertain about this because this comes back to the fundamental flaw of the regulation itself that is trying to do fundamental rights protection via basically a product safety approach. And uh, in the end, what we have then are standards uh, organizations that are completely undemocratic and will not be reformed in a way that they can work as democratic entities because that's not the way they work, right? And uh, it's, there, there's basically no pathway to change that fundamentally, that they will have, they will play this big role in um, uh, uh, making sure that, that um, the, the, um, the requirements by the AI Act are met. And I think it, it is, I don't have an idea how to resolve that and there may not be one. Okay, we have a next question. Uh, you in a white shirt. Thanks very much. Um, Oliver Marsh from Algorithm Watch, but I'll leave Matthias uh, for now. This is a, a question, I think, mostly for Kai. Um, I, when you said there's get, we want one word to sum up good regulation, I thought someone's going to say dynamic. I didn't expect it to be the first first word. But what, what does dynamic mean in this context? Let me give a slightly parodic interpretation and feel free to push back on it, of how a lot of EU legislation works. Um, there's a lot of work that goes into carving something sort of in stone, and then there's gaps left for delegated acts, standards bodies, et cetera, et cetera, but fundamentally the edifice is there. And it takes a long time and a lot of argument, and no one's happy with the edifice, but that's how government and politics has to work. Then when it meets the world, something is wrong with it that wasn't predicted, that wasn't expected, there really isn't a chance to change it. So the GDPR, for instance, personally, very glad it exists. There's lots of things I think people could accept is wrong with it, but it's, there's no room to change it for a long time. So what does, in that world, if, it, if that world is wrong, let me know. If that world is right, what does dynamic regulation look like? Thank you very much for posing this question, <laughs> because this gives me the chance to uh, talk a little bit more about it. So first of all, I completely agree with the points that you have been made and my boss and I, we are for a long time known as at the beginning the only critics of the GDPR and now we, I would say there is a lot of momentum in the European Union in Brussels that certain parts of the GDPR, as you said, it's good that it's there, um, are maybe not working and need to be adjusted and this is a big problem because as you said it's often um, and Potentially, it would be also with the AI Act. There is an adoption of an act, and then it's there for five to ten years because everyone is scared to open the uh, box of Pandora <laughs> because it can go uh, worse or can become worse, and so on and so on. Nothing happens. What I think the AI Act is doing um, extremely well is to integrate new forms of regulating. What I mean with that is you mentioned already um, delegated acts and uh, implementing acts. Um, so far I didn't see them so broadly being used in laws like in the AI Act. They are linked to a lot of annexes, to a lot of articles even that the Commission could basically adjust. For example, if there are new use cases that should be um, classified as high risk, they could add it. Um, the Parliament and the Council are still involved. We can say yes or no at least. It's not perfect, but it would speed up the process and you could actually then do changes in maybe six months or a little bit more. Also the standards, um, I, again, I see the problems, but it also allows specifications uh, that are maybe updated over time. Uh, it allows a lot of practitioners to participate and so on. Again, I see the problems that certain actors are not that much involved, but in principle, it's there. There is also the um, concept of regulatory sandboxes that is coming from the finance sector. Probably also those things will not work at the very beginning very well, maybe understaffed, underfinanced, and so on and so on. But in general, it kind of underlines this idea of private-public partnership, which is going through the AI Act, which is really, again, bringing um, our point back, having this idea of 
um, let's cooperate and constantly improve the law over time. And this I didn't see in, in my time in Brussels before. So I think it's a rather good um, point. And especially industry always told us, um, especially us as CDU, we need to be more involved. Uh, we need to tell you that you are going in the wrong direction and so on. Now they have the chance. And I'm really curious to see if industry is delivering. Civil society is often delivering. They are doing much more and specific um, lobbying in Brussels nowadays than industries. It is all over the place often and is, of course, also uh, need to address a lot of different topics while civil society organization can focus on a few ones. But yeah, it, it will be really interesting if especially industry is using all those new opportunities and we are preventing um, a situation like with the GDPR that there is a law with certain obvious problems and those problems will just not change for many, many years. Great to hear that. I'm just waiting for the lunch invitation by Thierry Breton. <laughs> okay, um, here, woman in blazer. Thanks a lot. Um, I have to say I really admire your optimism, Kai Sanger. Um, but I would, was really surprised, as you said, that you think that the increasing indistinguishability between machine-generated tax and human-made tax is just a transition phase. And maybe I'm not asking you, maybe I better ask the other people on the panel, what do you think? Is it really a transition phase? I mean, I, I fine-tuned a large language model and I could show that even experts on the material I fine-tuned my large language model on were not able to distinguish outputs of the model and the experts which, on which I trained them. And then so there are a lot of studies showing that we are less and less able to distinguish and we have no detection algorithm which do not commit false positive or false negative and so I'm surprised by your optimism and I want to know whether the other people are as optimistic as you are. Who wants to react? Yeah, we can, we can add another question. Yeah, Venice. Yeah. Firstly, uh, thank, uh, thank, I, I would like to thank all the panel, panelists here for sharing all the crucial insights about the AI regulation conundrum. Uh, my question here is directed towards Jan. And uh, you guys at Aleph Alpha are seen as the front runners of the European AI trend. And uh, with that, it's, it's, it's a fact that you are basing your business model on European values, such as uh, you're emphasizing on data sovereignty and uh, customization and so on. Uh, so, what other aspects are you like planning to differentiate yourself from your American counterparts, such as OpenAI and and uh, yeah, such other companies? Okay, um, Jan, do you have? Yeah, um, I'm happy. thank you. Uh, maybe I'm not gonna uh, answer your. I or I would rather like to first understand. Uh, maybe I I didn't hear that differently but what you meant with twin transitionary uh, just yeah. just just for for recap, yeah. better understanding so my point was that I think there needs to be a lot of digital literacy um, helping us to detect better what is um, artificially generated and what not okay. and basically it's that this probably will take four or five years until we are capable to detect those elements but you disagree. I think maybe watermarking and those things could maybe help, so technical tools, but well, this was my argument. Yeah, that's a, that's a very interesting uh, question. I, I, I do not have an answer to that. Um, I, uh, uh, it's, 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 I agree with you. It's, it's very, very difficult if you, if you do it right and if you know the context. I mean, uh, it, it really still very much depends on, uh, you know, having a large a language model trained for a certain context, and then it can be indistinguishable. In other contexts, it isn't. Um, it's it's fairly uh, fairly fairly easy to 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 spot, um, but uh, but there's clearly a danger resulting out of that. I, I would agree with that, uh, and I, I guess um, 
the the idea of le relearning critical thinking is certainly something uh, that that I would uh, emphasize. Uh, that's a trade that we that we have to relearn most definitely because when you you don't look at it uh, from just one perspective but from various perspectives and that probably will help. Uh, to answer your question, um, and, and I'm sure you, you have additions to that, but uh, just to very briefly answer your question. Well, uh, we, we do differentiate ourselves already in many ways in the sense that we very early on said we, we will focus on, on B2B, uh, not B2C, um, because, you know, uh, well, partly out of necessity, uh, you know, but, but also because our philosophy is very different to, to many of the players out there right now. We said we want to provide sovereign, human-centric, trustworthy AI. Uh, and uh, maybe I should just say two words to what that actually really means. Sovereign, we don't really uh, mean uh, um, that now, you know, let's focus on a geography or a jurisdiction or anything like that. It's more that giving people who, who work with us in our technology the ability to choose. Um, and uh, to, to, you know, don't force them on a hyperscaler, don't force them on a chip. Uh, we own our entire tech stack, but we're not going to tell you what, what you have to use. Uh, so that, that's, that's one aspect to it. Human-centric, we very much uh, um, believe in the idea that, that technology should augment humans and should not replace, it, replace them for many reasons. Uh, you know, assuming moral and ethical responsibility is definitely one of them. Um, and trustworthy, uh, if we want to put a human in a position to make better decisions, you just cannot have an LLM providing an answer and you just don't know where it comes from. Uh, I agree with you, uh, most of these LLMs, they, you know, it's for us humans, it's very difficult to think in, in well, more than four or five dimensions. Uh, but here we, I mean, this is, there's so many dimensions. Uh, it's literally impossible to, to truly understand what's going on within the algorithm. However, um, you know, what we, uh, when we said you have to put a human in a position to, to make a good decision, you need so much more than just text. That's why we develop multi, uh, multi um, uh, uh, multi, multimodal, that's the word, thank you. Uh, multimodality, uh, we invented it, it wasn't, it wasn't uh, the Americans. Um, because, you know, when, you, when we as humans, we try to capture information, it's very hard to just capture information in text. You, I mean, as we say, a, a picture says more than a thousand words. Uh, you know, that, that certainly helps. But the most important thing is explainability. Uh, when we make decisions, we don't just want an LLM to spit out an answer and we don't know where it comes from or how it derives that output from the given input. So explainability, we are still the only ones who are doing this. Um, uh, we developed the admin mechanism is fully open source uh, that really tells you, you can, you can see in the output which input factors determine the output and how could it be different. Uh, so that, that's something you have to know when you, when you try to make a better decision. But um, that, like all these things, they're already like clearly differentiate uh, ourselves from others. And one last uh, thing there, an LLM is powerful, but an LLM doesn't help you uh, realize true value alone. You have to have so much more than that. And that's why we, we don't consider ourselves primarily an LLM provider. It's a, it's a very important part of it. But you have to have the supporting structure on top of it that allows you to do inference, that allows you to, to uh, you know, we call it an intelligence layer, to actually really use templates uh, and know exactly what's going on. So um, that's what also distinguishes us from Mistral in many ways. Uh, and by the way, just uh, just to very briefly mention it, we also pushed for the regulations to go through for exactly the same reasons you just mentioned. Thank you. So we have time for one more question. Okay, that many questions in the back with the beige essay beige sleeve. Thank you. Thank you for a wonderful discussion. I was just wondering how you would define AI, especially in a regulatory sense, and how you would delineate it from, let's say, advanced statistical inference methods. 
we, we, we can have a round of everyone giving <laughs> the favor. <laughs> Should, uh, um, sure. So it's it's again a really good question. I just um, said to Matthias. Actually, our first meeting, we were both talking about it, and he was very surprised that I agreed with him that the AI Act should not be called AI Act, but maybe Automated Decision Making Act or something like this. Yes, again, it was Ursula von der Leyen, as it has been said, who wanted to make the statement, who wanted to create an act that. Uh, she and others can sell uh, very well, but technically, legally, it doesn't make that much sense. Now, specifically to your question, um, in the um, negotiations, we, based on what I said, those two camps in the parliament had huge problems to um, find an answer how to define it. Worldwide, it's a big question, and there are not a lot of convincing uh, answers to it. What we, in the end, as parliament uh, did where uh, was to look what the OECD did, because it's kind of, in German, herrschende Meinung, so <laughs> an opinion that many people can agree on. And it kind of allowed us to be both a bit happy because we on the conservative liberal side wanted to really focus on machine learning, which is possible with this definition, but it left um, for the Greens and for the social democrats also um, symbolic AI systems uh, in the scope and therefore covering, for example, the um, scandal in um, Netherlands, the child benefit uh, case where it was a machine learning uh, system that collected the data, but then a symbolic AI system that uh, led to the scandal. Um, in the end, the OECD definition is, however, so broad um, that together with Recital 6, it's definitely not clear what AI is. And you mentioned it. Is a classical software system maybe also included? No, the recital says no, but there are still a lot of, let's say, gray cases. And therefore, the commission will provide now guidelines, and I force them to do this. They need to build um, a long table where they are putting on the left side, this is AI, and on the right side, this is not AI. <laughs> it's not perfect, but this was the only way uh, to get a little bit more legal clarity. <laughs> now you get a, give, get a feel for why, why I'm so worried. Yeah, and maybe they're going to ask a, an LLM what, you know, how to make that table. But, you know, I would just, I would just like to <laughs> remind everyone of the very recent ruling by the European Court of Justice telling us what automated, us what automated decision making is. Uh, and uh, you should probably look into this to also get an idea of what is waiting for us for in the next couple of years to clarify what AI actually is. And the uh, funny part uh, about that ruling is that you know, it's about what constitutes automated decision making under the GDPR. Um, and the ruling says, yeah, there has to be some um, consequential application of the scoring system to the decision that is made in the end. And now we'll have to wait for another five years for <laughs> European Court of Justice to uh, rule on what is meant by consequential in this case, you know, because that is the next question that is going to be asked. And of course, no one is going to be able to answer it. Uh, so uh, this is what, what uh, we are looking forward to in the next 10 to 20 years. Yeah. So in 20 years, when we have our 40th anniversary, <laughs> we, perhaps we can debate and, and follow up. I would like to thank all the speakers for sharing your thoughts and insight. I would like to sh uh, thank the audience for great questions. I know many of you have more questions. Please join us to celebrate our 20th year anniversary at our reception, which is at Quartier Zukunft. When you go outside of the main um, exit of the Hertie School, you turn towards your right, there's a sign that says Quartier Zukunft. That's where our reception is. Everybody is invited. And uh, thanks so much for joining us tonight. Thank you. Thank you.